Kara, and thank you so much for taking sure. the time. You know, I, I watched the judge. I saw her demeanor. She was very defiant as she granted motion in limine after motion in limine for the prosecution today. I, I know you said that you're satisfied with that. You want this trial to be narrowly focused on the events of February 26th. But if something becomes relevant as to school records or drug use, I say you face an uphill battle with this judge to get it in. Well, I think it is. She's made some preemptive rulings, and I was hoping that she would just reserve ruling on most of it, because after all, as long as we know not to talk about an opening, and I'm very happy that the, the judge has instructed the state not to do so, then it really should be done in a dynamic fashion. Once the evidence is presented, whether or not it comes in is up to the judge if it becomes relevant at that point. See, a lot of people think that you are trying to make this the trial of Trayvon Martin, no, that you're all. trying to attack his character. No, what do you no. say to those people? It's very simple. Here's the way the case should go. We should focus on this case in the five or six minutes of what happened between George and Trayvon that night. If the state does that, that's all we care about. The problem with it is that if they go far afield, if they start talking about George's past or Trayvon's past or trying to throw in character information about either, then we have to be prepared. All the evidence that we got out last week that people complained that we were getting it out against Trayvon Martin, let's not forget a few things. One, that was available and known by the family since day one. They knew about all this information. And if I don't disclose that information, then we can never use it. So all I was really doing was putting a lot of weapons, if you will, in my quiver, hoping that they all stay there. I don't want to present that information, but may have to in response to what the state does. I heard the do judge leave the door open a bit for fighting. Mm -hmm. Text messages, emails may allude to that on the part of Trayvon Martin. I want to know objectively, what is the law in Florida? Okay, this is a self-defense case. There was a fight. It may be a very significant issue who started the fight. So what is the law in Florida in regard to Trayvon Martin, his propensity to right. fight or reputation in the community for fighting? Well, we start with the premise that in Florida, like every state, you're allowed to resist force with like force. When it gets to the level of force that is likely to cause great bodily injury, breaking your nose, smashing your head on the cement, something like that, then you're allowed to resist that with deadly force. So that's the baseline. Then, under the State versus Munoz case, the case that we have here in Florida, it says if we can show reputation or propensity, as you say, for violent acts, then that information, even if unknown to the defendant, can come into evidence because it, it shows or tends to show how the victim, in this case, may have acted as the aggressor. And right. That's why it's relevant. Last question I have, and then we'll throw it to other people. You want an anonymous jury, and I didn't hear the prosecution object to that because they are in fear of the pressures that can be paramount to this jury also. We know from Casey Anthony the pressures that can sure. come. All right, I've got to play devil's advocate here. All right, you have an anonymous jury, you do. But juror number one doesn't go to work for two months. Mm -hmm. They just don't show up to work. Juror yes, number sir. two doesn't go to church every Sunday for two months. They're, they're not going to be anonymous. It's not a perfect system, but if I don't request it and the judge doesn't give me the principle that we're going to have them anonymous, then we're worse off. If we try to have a perfectly anonymous jury and en end up with one that's only mostly protected, we're much better off than just leaving them to the, sorry, media wolves that may come <laughs> after them so well. on occasion. We, we want to be real careful. My concern is that my concern is for an acquittal, that they are going to be afraid to acquit my client because of what people will say about the acquittal. It's very real. I never forget, Kira, I, I remember when I finished the Casey Anthony case and I saw this sign posted in this restaurant saying that we will not give service to any of the jurors on the Casey Anthony case. I, I was shocked, but it was reality. And, uh, and Kira, you may have some questions for well, us from Yeah, Mark. you know what else is, and I know everybody here is going to weigh on on this, and Mark, this has been a huge discussion on this show, because we're about raising America, about our families, is the discussion of race. And Ben Crump has come forward and said, look, this is going to be the civil rights trial to watch. Uh, we have that thought, but just, I want to get your response. Do you agree with that? Do you feel that race is a very important topic uh, to keep in the forefront here as we go forward? Well, unfortunately, I don't think this is the case for it. And I've said this to Mr. Crump and to others who have asked me, though I'm very willing to have a conversation about race relations or civil rights in the criminal justice system in Florida or in the states, 
Let's talk about that. The problem with it is that this is not the case for that discussion. We know from the FBI investigation that George did not act in any type of a racist way. So why are we perpetuating this belief or this suggestion or this fantasy that it's a race-related event? Ryan, I think the main fantasy? reason why is because Ryan? people like Crump. Well, to, to black families the around this, this country, this case, I mean, I think they're going to take offense to that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't agree necessarily well, with the let fantasy. Me, let me, let me oh. clear it up. It would be a fantasy to suggest that in this case, race was a component because even the FBI suggested that George did not act in any racist way at all. So that's why I suggest it's a fantasy. I'm not the one who's saying it's a fantasy that race relations need to be addressed in the criminal justice system. I've requested, invited that conversation. Just get your crosshairs off my client on a case where race doesn't have a proper place. Here's what Ben Crump had to say, and Ryan, I'll let you take the lead after this. Today was very important because the trial is on track to come forth on June 10th. This family has wanted to have their day in court. They wanted to not have their son's death be in vain. And so they pray continuously that the justice system does not fail them. Mr. Mayor, my, my question is, do you believe that uh, Trayvon Martin was a violent person? I, I try not to comment on the evidence. I know that some of the evidence that well, was I don't, presented was I don't mean was the evidence. I'm just propensity. saying from, from what you've seen, because as a, as a black man, he wore a hoodie, and you said, you know, that you're not trying to put race into it, but do you believe that he was a violent person. A hoodie, of course, has nothing to do with anything. It's, it's not indicative of race. It's not indicative of violence. It's not indicative of anything. So a hoodie has nothing to do with it. The evidence that has been presented today is just discovery. It may not ever make it into a courtroom. So the question of whether or not Trayvon was violent may or may not become relevant. You know that. It only becomes relevant if the state says he was completely nonviolent. We know the one issue that is of the primary concern for the jury in this case is who started the fight. And we may argue about what the word started means and, and what George did was at the beginning or whatnot, but that's up for the jury to decide. I'm not going to sit here and say Trayvon Martin is a violent person, except the evidence seems in Con incontrovertible that the first blow that was struck was struck by Trayvon Martin and that he was never hit with a fist throughout the entirety of the 40 seconds that someone, we believe it was George, but someone was screaming for help. And we do know that George suffered significant bodily injury. If you want to define that as being that came from a violent person, you can make that definition. I don't need to. Well, I know one thing is that, you know, George Zimmerman will be able to defend himself. Trayvon Martin cannot. Mark O'Meara, I appreciate your no, time. No, Trayvon Martin is a victim of a homicide. We understand that. We truly do. And there's no, no loss of sympathy for that event. But as with every death, whether it comes from a car accident or from a justifiable homicide, there is a loss. The state will present Trayvon's side and we will present George's. Mark, thanks so much. He, he, came, he joined in at the last minute and you didn't know what you were in for. We always appreciate an, an authentic and, and uh, honest discussion. Mark, thank you. Gene, thank you.